okay all right uh, good morning good afternoon and good evening everyone uh, and welcome to this uh, webinar series of uh, infos asia oceana uh, this is the first webinar in the in a three part series and i would like to welcome you on behalf of both incose india chapter as well as the uh, sector 3 and with me i have uh, surge uh, on the line uh, who is the sector 3 leader and uh, i'll quickly talk very briefly talk about incose india chapter and then i'll hand it over to surge to welcome the speaker uh, i would also request everyone to mute themselves please so uh, quickly talking about incose india chapter uh, we have been uh, hosting a series of webinars um, for the last couple of years since covid uh, happened and um, so this is about 24th in that series and uh, about uh, incose at large we have about 19000 plus members with 65 plus chapters all over the world and incose india uh, was started as incose uh, india south chapter in 2010 so we are celebrating the 12th year of its formation and we have about 210 individual members with us today um uh, if you want to collaborate with us uh, we have more than three technical working groups uh, which are very active the architecture mbsc and phm working group and uh, of course there are several uh, events uh, such as this uh, that are there for possible to collaborate with us so i won't take much time since we have surge on the call uh, i'm really excited about uh, this collaboration So I'll hand it over to Serge. Maybe Serge, you can quickly introduce the AOSEC as well as uh, the 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 webinar series. With my microphone on, it's easier. Yeah. Uh, I, I will. Uh, my name is Serge Landry. So I'm I'm the uh, the director for the third sector of uh, of Incose. We have three sectors. We have Americas. We have uh, Europe, Middle East, and Africa. and we have asia oceania so we are the smallest sector but we are the fastest growing this series of um, of events and uh, there will be also a tutorial next week uh, has been uh, designed so that we serve our region better at a time where uh, maximum of people from asia oceania uh, can attend uh, so it's it's a beginning so today it looks like we have not as many people as uh, expected but uh, we will read last year's events to to make a change into that to to boost up the uh, audience the uh, incose is doing a lot of things uh, but many of the events are happening at different times so, so the idea was to try to rectify this balance and that's the reason we have this event so a small little advertisement here for the um, regional event uh, which is coming in october this year Uh, and which will happen in India in Bangalore. So if you don't know what to do in October, that's a very, very good event to consider. There are many other worldwide events, uh, but India is a bit closer to uh, to your home, very likely if you are linking here from the Asia Oceania sector. Um, now the our okay uh, the today the show um, we have uh, both uh, IBM and Continental who have. Uh, uh very nicely uh volunteer to uh to uh, to, to trigger this um, this triptych uh and uh, this three this show of webinars um today we are going to talk about mbsc mobile uh, model driven uh, system engineering uh the in the automotive sector so it's going to be a little bit of theory uh from marco and uh, a very practical example uh from uh, from the automotive sector from continental the company and uh without further ado i leave the floor to marco thank you very much uh, sarge uh, thank you very much mudit and the incosi leadership team and i'm going to start um so yes you can all see my screen now and uh so today um we are going to talk about uh, driving driving radical innovation with mbsc in the automotive sector but uh, what we discuss you can see that can be uh, applicable also to other type of uh, sectors that need needs to deal with the uh, uh, new uh, development of uh, innovative product so myself marco forlingeri i am italian based in singapore and i'm responsible for engineering uh, for the asean region and i also support uh, 
for IBM, for the engineering brand, the South Korea, Australia, and New Zealand uh, market. So, and then we have Enrico. Hello. Please, Enrico. Yeah. Yes, uh, hello. Uh, and also thank you for the opportunity today to participate on this webinar. My name is Enrico Seidel. I'm German, but also based in Singapore, work for Continental in Singapore. I'm a senior technical expert for systems engineering and methodology. And my role in Continental is at the moment to support and evangelist the um, model-based system engineering. Thank you very much, Enrico. So let's get it started. So today we will start uh, with uh, introducing a little bit uh, from my side, the MBSC application, why it is needed to manage complexity and drive innovation. And then I will hand over to Enrico. Enrico will make an overview of MBSC at Continental. And then he will dig down into the Continental case, a real uh, example, uh, simplified of course for this webinar where you can see the application of MBSC in driving innovation, uh, such as uh, server zone architecture in automotive. We have a session for you, and we'll be really happy to answer your questions. So let's get started. Uh, first of all, what we see in the last uh, years, and that's basically what I experienced as a consultant or employee or now tool vendor working in the automotive sectors with different clients, and is the increasing complexity in the way automotive uh, um, cars are basically developed. So if you look at the functionality that a car had 20 years ago, we will see a very um, big change in terms of functionalities and also in terms of complexity of such functionalities in the way they are implemented and the way they are orchestrated. And above all, they are mainly nowadays software driven. So most of the functionality are implemented with part or exclusively with software. So that's why we have an increasing complexity in terms of uh, functionality. Uh, and this is mainly uh, due to two reasons. Actually, it doesn't come from me, this, uh, uh, this, uh, this, this motivation of complexity, but it comes from the INCOSI Vision 2035. Huh? And the main two drivers of complexity are the technology driven complexity. It means that before company were used to make basically mechanical electrical intensive product. And, uh, and now uh, in, in the last uh, decades, we uh, shifted first into the electronic, then software. And now we have more and more uh, adaptive behavior. Okay, so it means that we are talking more about uh, sometimes data and algorithm intensive, where uh, if you take the example of the car, it needs to understand how to behave in the change of the context where it's operating. Then we had another type of uh, complexity driver, that's the scope complexity. So we go from the development of a single component, if you look at the example of the automotive industry, the ECU boxes, uh, up to a uh, bigger subsystem and a domain area like, sub, like powertrain, and then we start to uh, uh, go into more and more system of system okay, development. It means not just the car, it's the car connected in its environment that interact with the uh, server that is somewhere placed in the cloud. Uh, if you took an uh, example of the electric car, it needs to interact with the electrical station, the charging station, uh, ADAS uh, system need to interact with uh, the environment where it operates and so on and so forth. So it's more a system or system topic. And this type of complexity does not apply only to the automotive, but apply to mm, the majority of the complex systems. Okay, That's actually also the focus of Incosi. And uh, I've been working myself for in the aviation industry for Airbus. Uh, leading MBSC and product line engineering there before joining this new uh, challenge at IBM. And they exactly experienced the same uh, challenge uh, in the aviation industry and probably to your industry too. So let's have a look now in the automotive industry in particular and see uh, together with this complexity, what are the new drivers that brings uh, the need of uh, new innovation in the automotive industry. First, uh, it's clear for everybody the process of electrification. Uh, we look at Tesla, we look at, uh, uh, to mention some name, Vinfast in Vietnam, 
or the traditional automotive industry in uh, in the US uh, and in Germany, we see that all of them are going to this electrification trend. Uh, next generation of the architecture. So we will talk today about that, uh, about the service zone architecture concept. So we are transforming the way the architecture of the car it's uh, being developed, and also Enrico will explain uh, more in details why and why this is happening. And uh, uh, as I mentioned before, autonomous driving, uh, it's also a very big topic. So where since many years, many companies uh, are trying to, to achieve. And finally, uh, last but of course not least, and also we can mention many others of drivers, these are just the, the major ones, it's the, the importance of the driving experience and passenger experience. It's not anymore just going from point A to point B, but it's really the experience itself of driving a car or being inside a car. And, uh, and actually, all these trends, all these upcoming innovations are for the majority based on software implementation. Okay? And uh, we will see that in the, in the upcoming years, the, the lines of code that will be in the car and the data will increase more, more, and more, okay? And actually, dramatically increase. Uh, but of course, this is not just, this is a good thing, uh, because we are going to simplify uh, the, the way the functionality are implemented. On the other side, there is a problem of defect increase. Just to take a number, 2018 in the US, um, there would be a total of 8 million uh, cars that have been recalled because of software defects. So more software, more lines of code also means more defects. So we need to manage this complexity. And uh, it, it's not just about the recall of the cars, also these, uh, can, uh, this type of complexity and the, the, the need of developing new products can bring uh, a delays. As we see in 2020, 40% of the automotive vehicle had been delayed and also the parts that made up the cars. Uh, so, and in this context, as I mentioned before, the automotive industry is moving into this next generation e architecture, software architecture. So in this regard, the cars will look simpler, okay? Because you will have less boxes, less harness, less ECU, more centralized control. Uh, however, the innovation that is uh, going to be developed in place is huge. And this requires high system engineering skills. And this requires very uh, important uh, uh, effort in uh, developing this type of innovation by managing complexity at the same time. Just to give you a quick example, the typical architecture, traditional architecture, consists of around 100 ACUs today. And they have multiple communication buses with wires, harnesses. And, uh, and this basically is going to shift into an architecture where we have uh, much less wiring, we have few high performance computers uh, and uh, uh, they will basically control the functionality in the cars and there will be the possibility to enable disable update functionality on the air in these uh, high performance computer and so it would be uh, much easier to update to create variants of the cars and uh, the functionality don't need to be designed uh, on purpose when the ECU, for example, has been developed, this could also be updated in a second stage. So it's a big transformation, it's a big revolution, and uh, we need uh, uh, some uh, uh, solution for it. Now, coming from IBM, I'm, uh, I have to say that, uh, of course, companies, and I think the biggest automotive companies today have it, if not IBM, it could be with other uh, tool vendors or so ALM and PLM systems. Uh, here we focus on ALM, application of cycle management. And basically, they need to have a consistent uh, um, requirement management, uh, uh, so workflow management, change management, test management, in order to deal with the development of the system and software. But of course, also is needed model-based system engineering because it can bring in particular for the development of such innovation and to manage this type of complexity, uh, it's a, a discipline that is already important. It's already like a main character in many system engineering organization. However, it will increase its importance uh, in the future. And uh, so for those that are not familiar with it, so MDSC, model-based system engineering, it's basically 
system engineering done with the support of models, okay? So the classical system engineering activity, like uh, requirements, uh, so uh, definition, the management, design analysis, VNV, uh, for the entire life cycle of the product or the system uh, can be It's that uh, the trend is to go from uh, document-based engineering, the engineering based on uh, documentation, so this is the one big trend, into model-based automated engineering. As I said, engineering supported by models. Document can be still produced, but that will be exported out of the models. The second trend is that we are going, uh, take the example of this new architecture, so now functionalities are not mechanical, software, electrical, functionality can uh, is developed across domains. That's why we need more collaboration we need to go from uh, engineering in silos into collaborative integrated engineering. So these are the two trends that bring organization in automotive and in other sectors into model based system engineering. And this means going from the traditional engineering, where we have the classical V model cascading of requirements uh, uh, up to the implementation and then uh, the right side of it and where each team each domain work independently and just exchange through meetings through documentary information will go into uh, and we are going into a dimension where the model the system model it's uh, the main character of and everybody can relate to the system system models will still have requirements domain specific discipline but this will be let's say the trade union the bridge across the discipline, also the bridge of collaboration for the different system engineers. Just to refresh before Enrico starts, what is a system? So the system, it's uh, what you see is in reality, the car, for example, in itself, with the chassis and all the system, internal and external systems. A model, it's an abstraction of that, an abstraction of the reality. And this means that the model cannot represent all the aspects of the car but needs to focus on specific viewpoints, on specific representation that are needed for the engineers. Second important concept, we can have descriptive model. It means that the model substitutes the text-based specification, for example, or are needed to capture knowledge. And we can have analytical model, model that can be analyzed, can be verified, okay? So these are basically the main difference between a uh, uh, descriptive and analytical model. Today we will see, of course, uh, this, a bit of descriptive model, but that will be transformed into analytical models, okay, through model execution. Now, uh, now the small refresh is not about tool only, even if I belong to a tool vendor organization like IBM. So we need important pillars, okay? So I'm mentioning and uh, quoting the Ligati. So we have uh, uh, three pillars in model-based system engineering. The process, so how the company are going to perform system engineering with the support of models, okay? Applying a language like SysML and using a specific tool or tool chain. Second, the language, as I mentioned, SysML if you develop system, UML if you develop software, but we are now in system development. So what we will use is uh, SysML as a formalization and. Uh, syntax and then the tool itself so of course uh, we uh, support and uh, we promote and Rico will show the example done in Rhapsody but uh, other tools can support also in a very good way uh, the development of model-based system engineering and uh, so since we are going to see Rhapsody the IBM Rhapsody tool uh, some few uh, notes about the, the tool itself, and then these uh, points you will see implemented in the RICO presentation. So first, uh, uh, it enables the design of architecture using both UML and SysML. Today we will see a SysML example. Uh, it gives you the possibility to specify the interfaces through uh, IBD uh, or uh, through uh, sequence diagrams, for example, in the exchange of signals. and. Uh, also, if you have a system like ALM system, uh, for example, from IBM, uh, the engineering life cycle management, you are able to link the requirement, the test cases, the different work items, the task to the model itself. So it's not just a model uh, isolated development, but it's model integrated with other artifacts as well. Very important for big organization. 
the model itself uh, can be executable, so are executable, it can be executed. So in Rhapsody, this is just a simple example, but Enrico will show the uh, better one and more exhaustive one. And the uh, simulation can be analyzed and uh, can be run also with other tools integrated in Rhapsody. And finally, for the software experts, also codes can be generated out of it. So this is just to introduce a bit to the, the tool. Uh, the main characteristic of the tools. And now I will uh, give the, the audience a uh, stage to Enrico and Enrico can uh, explain better how this is done and for example. Thanks Enrico. You can go on. I will stop okay. So then let me share. Okay, I think the screen should be visible. Good, then let's continue with the second part, model-based system engineering at uh, Continental. Um, many, many people might know Continental uh, for their tire business, but uh, besides this tire business and uh, the rubber business in Contitec, one of the biggest uh, group is uh, by far automotive. I think meanwhile, it's as big as the other two together. I'm working in the architecture and networking uh, business area beside um, for other business area, uh, namely uh, safety and motion, autonomous mobility, user experience and smart mobility. I, I like to talk a little bit more about uh, architecture and networking. Uh, this business area has a specific um, task or a specific goal to deliver basically the backbone be between the other four business areas and their products. So we build the communication backbone, um, we uh, build the machine to machine uh, communication between as Marco said, high-performance computers. We develop the backbone for the high-performance computers. We um, develop, as I showed them later, um, specific controllers which are located in a zone area, in a zone, in an area of a vehicle we call zone controllers. And we build also the connection to the outside world. We call it simplified the cloud, you know, backend services, uh, data services, um, what a vehicle is reading, what a vehicle is sending and so on. So we have a quite important role to link all business areas together. As Marco already introduced, I'm, I like to stay a little bit longer on that slide to explain the trend in, in more details. As you see here on the left side, a classic car typically, we call it a component, uh, contains a typically component defined architecture with functionalities isolated in one ECU for a dedicated purpose. Uh, you can have, for example, a body control unit to control lights and wiper and things like that. You have a control unit to actuate the tailgate. You have control units like an airbag and things like this. Due to the increase of complexity, those units become more and more and more. And also, as Marco said, ne, we have meaning, meanwhile, in a mid-class car, up to 100 actuator sensors and ECUs de delivering the expected functionality of a vehicle, which includes, of course, and a lot of wires, which is heavy. Can you, I think you can imagine that um, wire harness can get up to two, 300 kilogram, uh, dependent on the car grade and up to two kilometers of wire. Ne? This is a lot of weight when we think down towards the electric, to, uh, the electric vehicles where we have to reduce uh, also weight to be more energy efficient, um, that an um, architecture change is needed. A car, this is also a an, an very important topic. The component-driven architecture 
has been fixed during design time. So once the concept and the design has been made for a car, the function has been defined in form of specifications, in form of an architecture. And when the car goes to a serious production, that's the functionality. There's no reduction, no add-on. Whenever you have to add on something, you have to redesign one or more ECUs to update functionality. And uh, this is ending in a quite big amount of effort and cost to keep a vehicle up to technology, up to a state of technology. So the vehicle was in the past basically driven by pleasure, safety, and comfort. Nowadays, the vehicle is changing and the user expectation is changing. Everyone knows smartphones, everyone owns a smartphone. Many families, many people have at home IoT devices to control their, their house, their household, their, their own personal environment. And the same expectation, uh, expectation the people have from a car. They, we call it the user expectation changes from this pleasure, safety, and comfort into a smart IoT device on wheels. So when you sit in a car, you want to have a permanent connection to the cloud. You want to have an, um, a possibility to easily update functionality like you're used to have on smartphones. No? You update an app, you download an app, you use an app with additional functionality. The same will happen with the vehicle. You will be in the future able to upload and to download data and to um, download new applications extending your functionality, which drives a complete new dimension of um, business models, even for an OEM, to set up already a hardware, but to disable the functionality and then to enable via subscriptions or other pay models, those functionalities, or to enable third party to add on additional functionality, as long as it is not um, jeopardizing, for example, security or functional safety, there are some, some limitations. So the computing power will much, much more rise on this kind of um, expected vehicle, what we want to have, where we, what we have to address using a new concept of high performance computers, but not as many as we have in the classic design more, two, three uh, high performance computers, a little bit still domain separated, and a number of so-called zonal computers or zone controllers, which are responsible to translate those HMI physical interactions to react to events like sensors and actuators, to abstract this information and give it to the high performance computers, controlling the so-called user perceivable logic. And this design change um, requires also in rethinking in how to do the architecture, because you have to abstract the physical aspects into functional aspects so that a high performance computer does not need to have any physical interface anymore beside communication uh, interfaces. This, of course, can reduce um, by far the number of wires and the length of this wire harness. And the high performance computers, they have so much uh, power that they can also automatically update. So keywords are flash over the air, no, uh, diagnostic over the air. Um, just update like you are used from a smartphone without going to any service station. Let's go a little bit more into some details of that. Um, architecture, we have typically one or two, sometimes more depends on the grade, but typically two high performance computers still a little bit separated in uh, domains like the, the powertrain domain and the in interior infotainment domain. And those high performance computers are connected with an ethernet backbone, um, not just a single one, not in a star, it's quite a, a ring topology so that we have a safe communication, even if one uh, communication line will drop due to some uh, whatever mistake can happen. Um, to those high performance computers are then connected also via this uh, Ethernet so-called zone control units. And these zone control units have the main aspect to pre-process data. The user perceivability, the user logic, 
the application logic is mainly handled in those areas and time critical application or specific safety application or the sensing and actuation and the interpretation, interpretation of this data is handled in zone controllers. And each of this zone controller is then located in an area where a lot of information need to be processed, where a lot of uh, data need to be sensed or where a lot of actuation need to take place, typically in the corners of the vehicle, no? Specific, specifically for light functions, for ADAS, when you have all your uh, radar leader sensors here around the car. And in the dashboard are more or less than the uh, interactors and sensors for the user to interact with the vehicle still. Those uh, zone controllers are then connected to um, sensor and actuator ECUs, which are having which, which are what that also have a processor inside, but they are purely uh, sensing and actuating then so-called devices or non-intelligent actuator or sensor. This can be a lamp, a switch, and temperature sensor, whatever you can imagine technically um, you sense. You'd give this information via then LIN or CAN to the zone controllers. They interpret this information into something completely independent from hardware. So you can exchange um, later hardware without the need that this high performance computers need to change something in their calculation behavior so that you have a higher flexibility to even enable plug and play systems by standardizing those devices and those uh, zone ECUs and even the um, sensor and actuator ECUs. You can really make a plug and play capable vehicle in the future. And of course, last but not least, the permanent connection uh, to the cloud for backend services, for security, for whatever you can imagine um, linked to those high performance computers. How does it look like then in Rhapsody? Continental has chosen since years already Rhapsody since Rhapsody has an um, really an extended capability to be customizable and to develop very formalized architecture, not just painting, but really building executable models where you can later reuse the code to further uh, transform into productive um, code to be used then in the ECUs. What you see here is a typical uh, reflection of the previous um, illustrated picture, having a high performance computer in the middle, controlling so-called user perceivable um, functions, which are completely independent from hardware, and additional functionalities deployed in so-called zone controllers or zone area nodes. We are talking here a bit about abstracted nodes, which can be later then implemented in some hardware um, related to a certain area or to a certain zone of a vehicle. And the importance is here to see in this new uh, revolutionary architecture is, which is basically quite simple in the end, that you separate the sensing and the actuation from the pure processing hardware independent. So the target is that those signals, what you're receiving and sending are always the same. They can be standardized regardless what kind of hardware you have here behind. A light command is always a light command in the end. Now, if you have a matrix light or a simple bulb in front of the car uh, to illuminate the street, it doesn't matter in the end. Following such principles, you're able to distribute easily actuation and sensing to areas of a vehicle, which can be time critical um, to those zone controllers and to keep the user perceivable logic in such kind of high performance computers. What you see here is the illustration independent even on communication channels. This is also a very different approach. We don't need to understand at the beginning when we build our architecture, how this information is being transported over ethernet, over CAN, over LIN, it doesn't matter. Important is to understand what we are transforming and what we are transferring between those nodes. And then with this modeling approach, we are able to calculate out of this given structured data, the bandwidth as we need and can choose then later the simplest or the cheapest solution necessary for this communication. So we have a very flexible way by separating 
communication from features and later when you integrate this to bring it back together and this we achieve uh, at continental with a developed architecture framework called CAF, the capability architecture framework to address such different topics with this we come to the case study and here i want to quickly jump into a live demo just with one uh, slide left over to illustrate that this complex uh, architecture um, and design to bring into seven, six to seven simple steps, which starts basically with a feature definition, the system context and the system of interest definition. We use this, um, or we do this, uh, perform, we do this definition on an operational viewpoint to understand from the system engineering perspective how a system should look like. We analyze the system. We define actors, we define the interaction between the parts, I will show this. The next step is the operation analysis, where we look more to the, towards the behavior using use case diagrams, we refine them into activities, we um, perform a recursive uh, activity and, and um, behavior analysis. Finally, understanding how our function need to be designed. So we clearly separate between analysis and functional design and the functional design is done on the functional viewpoint where we really define out of this understanding what we want to have our functionality in an executable manner using state machines and a further refinement of activities to make them executable. This functionality we place them those function blocks we place them into logical nodes which reflect in an still abstracted way but which reflect already our target system for example those zone areas that we have, have a zone node and the high performance computer where we have then a high performance computer node to deploy those functionalities and this network what we tested already between those functions the the, the communication to later then verify this as well in a model verification including such kind of um, logical elements in a way which is completely machine verifiable. So we don't need to make so many reviews by hand and looking into the system, we just um, perform, we use SysML as a base, as a language and enriched with a method what we developed in our architecture framework with certain um, standardized uh, viewpoints with standardized abstraction level with standardized uh, interfaces and so on to design such kind of architecture to uh, get control or to control this uh, complexity of um, the architecture let's now jump inside the model and i explain a little bit how this looks then in detail this is rhapsody um, in the way as we modified with our architecture framework it's a little bit simplified here to show, let me quickly abstract what kind of functionality I want to show. I want to focus a little bit on this exterior light because it's quite simple to illustrate this server zone concept. Let's assume we have a vehicle and we can control the exterior light, this front light and the tail light uh, with a manual light switch. This is, is illustrated here. Now we can simulate something like this. We switch on in our simulation then and the light switch by rotating to a certain position, lights are activated front and right. I can control the position light, not then just the position light are active. I can illuminate this in the dashboard and can simulate this here, or I can control this in such a way, even reflected in signal names here illustrated to go to an auto light position. And then with a light sensor, I detect, for example, illustrated here, um, the light intensity, the light sensor is typically here in this area of a front shield, detect looking in the sky and detecting the environmental light. So I can see um, dependent on a certain light intensity, if I have to switch on with a certain timing, such kind of function. Uh, function no? um, you see, the focus is here on the user perceivability without focusing too much on the implementation of a certain light, how it should actually be you know, if it's a bulb or if it's a led or if it's a matrix light this is not the purpose here the purpose is to focus on user perceivability and dashboards are perfect doing that coming back to our steps 
we have, I said that we look to the feature definition. At first, you need to understand what you want to do. Therefore, we define, for example, for N vehicle with this customized architecture framework, our features. We focus here, for example, to um, functional features. Let me play, maybe zoom in a little bit more that you see this better. Um, we focus on functional features and in form of bullet points, we write down what we uh, expect from the vehicle. We can bring this into a relation with an optional aspect of having an automatic light feature or not. And we also can decide already on that level what kind of technical capabilities we want to have. Therefore, we can also create so-called technical features in a technical feature model where we can then inter link those uh, features um, to say, when I have auto light, I need the auto light sensor and so on. Step one. Step two, system context and system of interest. Here we um, define simply our uh, context. Let me just uh, quickly show this um, context definition. We identify in which form a vehicle is interacting with the environment, having a user interaction, having environmental effects um, affecting the car or the car is affecting by environmental effects the environment. This we define, we bring in an IVD, as everybody already knows, into a relationship. We identify events, inform how a user or how an effect is um, inter, uh, affecting the, the car. And those environmental effects, those events, we can later translate into um, values to be used then for further functional design. We can make a use case analysis. Um, I cannot go too much in detail how this um, use case analysis will be done in all uh, details, but um, it is basically that we also have um, customized uh, use cases to say we have a system use case where the user can interact. We have system processes to provide certain things where a system use case can be derived. We have continuous or secondary use cases, continuous use cases to monitor things continuously, secondary use cases to be used to in be included and so on. So we can design quite in detail with a use case, with specified uh, specialized use cases, such kinds of uh, behavior. Coming to step three, those use cases need to be refined. This is now an important step where we are following basically the harmony process from uh, IBM. So it is important now, and this is really an important step to identify the functionality, how we can do that. So we need, for example, to say when here in this example, with a stoplight, at first I have to understand that the stop, um, that somebody presses the, the brake pedal. So we have to detect this, we have to sense it. And then once we have detected this, then we can think about an user perceivable logic. Okay, user is pressing the brake pedal, has a brake request, can then actuate or request or command the stop lamps. How is then in the actuation placed? We need to take then those activities and refine them further to end up later in a functionality in our functional design which uh, looks then like this, come on. Let me say, this is our functional composition. In this functional composition, we identify really the sensing functionality, the actuation functionality here below, uh, and the, for example, static light control. And inside the static light control from those activities, we refine then, for example, a state machine, as you see here including functional safety and everything what is needed. Once we have this network of this functions identified, we can combine them together and can build beside of single functions. And because of uh, beside this evaluation of a single functionality, we can build a complete network. So this network we can simulate already without knowing anything where a function is being deployed. We just think this can be some wherever in a, in a vehicle. The important thing is in a server zone control concept that we separate the sensing, the actuation and the user perceivability part. And here in our framework, we use for this dedicated elements uh, together with a decomposition scheme to achieve this. 
So once we have this done and we have our function analysis done, we can implement and embed those functionality in our logical architecture. And there's a very specific way how to do that. We don't allocate because with allocation, we cannot simulate. You can, with allocation, point everything to everything, but you cannot really verify if this is a suitable and uh, workable environment for your functionalities. Let's jump first um, to how we uh, implement in those nodes, come on. <clears throat> we have a, a lot of uh, models here in this regard, a lot of uh, diagrams, not to lose the focus. So we have our server zone model where we say, okay, we want to deploy certain functionalities in certain nodes. Then we analyze those functions. What functionality can fit in what node? We even, what I cannot show here, but we even have zone models where we can place locally those functions. We embed those functions into nodes and connect those nodes together and reach to the diagram as you have seen here already in the PowerPoint and here live again. And the cool thing is you can now link, and this is a very specific uh, way how we do this. I show this here on the high performance computer. We are able to link functionalities and the instances of those functions by embedding them in the nodes, um, merging them, merging functional values into logical signals and further being able then to transport complex information from a simple value to a complex set of values over a set of signals. So we can formally link um, viewpoints even to be still executable. This is a very significant difference to the classic uh, system uh, engineering where we allocate functionality to some physical uh, block elements where we don't know if it fits in or doesn't fit in. This is a very important point to consider. You need to be able in a server zone concept to simulate complex behavior over your borders, not just a simple state machine. So we have maybe still uh, two minutes where I can show how we then also verify the behavior, which is the last step. Uh, let me close everything what we don't need here and focus just on the uh, main diagram. It's close, Rhapsody is closing this. So let's say we are low beam on. So once we are, um, we have an available executable model, it is very simple to verify them. Let's focus, for example, when I switch on and off the light, I can go into my light functionality and abstraction level help to understand where exactly I am in my uh, vehicle, in my complex uh, system. I go to my system product, which is for example, then later implemented in a high performance computer, go to my light control, enable my already running uh, instance of the state chart. And then you see in this state charts, it's a little bit small. So uh, we are in the headlight state reflected as shown in the panel. I can off the light here, now nah, come on. I can off, uh, then we switch the light off. I can go to auto light position. I can change here the uh, sensitivity and I can follow in a very simplified way um, if my car is operating as I expect. I can make simulate even sensor failures going into an uh, automatically uh, predefined safe state and verify to a uh, safety integrity level, even until ACLD or CIL3, uh, my entire vehicle function in a very flexible manner. Um, with this- Rico, you can show the light intensity, so- Yes, uh, I can show the light intensity. It's also no problem. You see, we are now light on. I can go into my light switch sensing, which is the sensing part, as you have seen before in one of those, uh, sensor areas. I can also enable this. Uh, show here, oh no, this is the light switch sensing. Now yeah, it's the same effect here. Um, let me go to the auto light sensing. You see, we can also use in Rhapsody easily to focus on the simulation elements with, without all the, the rest of the things. Um, here we are in a light sensor. And in this light sensor, you can see 100 
um, when we, for example, we are now in a fail state no? because we are below zero, which is an invalid value. I just, for example, jump back to, let's say, less than 10%, then I'm jumping into the headlight state. And when, for example, I place here 80%, then stepwise, you will see uh, over all those timing behavior, we will jump to the daylight state. Um, but we, in this sense of an abstract, the detection of a physical aspect into some requests function-wise to the high-performance computer so that the high-performance computer can focus on, I am in a daylight state, light off. I'm in a headlight request state, headlight on, and so on, using then all the other complex conditions uh, beside us. Enrico, if I can add something, this uh, light uh, state, this light intensity, reproduce yes. like the environment, okay? So for yes. example, the car is entering a tunnel, so it becomes a bit darker, and then the auto light function is recognizing yes. that, it's activating the light. And the, exactly, yes. we can test and replicate this with the behavior in Rapsi. Correct. That's uh, that's exactly the way. And this you can perfectly simulate. When you see this complexity and you describe this with requirements, I guarantee you, you have to write your 50 to 60 requirements to cover this, where you have just here one model to explain the same thing, executable and verifiable together with the customer. You can communicate architecture much better using this MBSE. Thank you very much, Enrico. I think we, we want to leave some minutes for the for the questions. Certainly. Q &A, yeah. Certainly. I can hand over to Murit for the Q&A, if there is any questions. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Enrico. Thanks, Marco. Excellent presentation. Um, I, I myself have a lot of questions, but let's go to the chat. Um, so the first comment is from Pradeep. Uh, this is a really good case study. I want to know if this is done in alignment with ISO 15288 and how. Definitely, of course, uh, we comply, for, of course, with these uh, principles uh, to any, and with also with this architecture framework to any of those standards, you know, although the 42010, the ISO, uh, the ISO standard uh, for safety, uh, 26262, um, is fully compliant to this and also compliant to SysML. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, then the next question is from Varuna. Uh, how to model networking, for example, telematics and gateway? Also, is it possible to connect simulation model with the AWS cloud? Definitely possible. And we are doing this in practice at Continental. Okay. We have several ecosystem architecture models uh, to reflect the AWS um, and those cloud applications. But it is a bit more complex to do that and therefore you need a quite good skill set and a lot of training for the engineers so if you think you start with mbse don't start with communication outside a certain domain this makes your life very troublesome at the beginning start simple and gradually increase while the capability of the engineers are increased but it's definitely possible to model communication and we are doing this down to the last bit of the specific protocol. Oh, okay. Excellent. Um, so the next question is actually from, from me. Um, uh, the question is, is there a need to consider, let's say, the real-time nature of embedded systems uh, or even the parallel computing, right, or parallel threads at computer level, because we are talking about that architecture now uh, at, at this level. And if yes, then how are we considering that uh, at a simulation level in Rhapsody? Okay, here depends what you want to achieve. Um, let's say if you want to show the architecture related to the structure, you focus on that. You don't make behavior models. If you want to include a behavior simulation, you need to focus. Do you make a function model or do you need to make an implementation model? Uh -huh. A function model is just to verify the intended behavior while a fun and the implementation model goes down to the details to make productive code out of this. Mm -hmm. So you have to decide how deep you want to dive and the effort is exponential increasing the deeper you dive. So you have to focus what you want to do and you can focus in some areas deeper and in some areas less what is known to you. Don't do architecture for um, satisfaction for yourself. Use architecture to communicate to others. Model only what you need to model. Mm -hmm. And basically, if I can add something on that, uh... 
uh, you can, uh, in this uh, CAF, this architecture framework from Continental, you have different uh, viewpoints. So today we just saw up to the logical viewpoint, but you still have the technical and the physical viewpoint, yes. okay? Mm -hmm. So it means that you can go down the description. Plus, don't forget that we can link uh, Autozar. If you go into implementation model, we can have Autozar architecture linked, uh, um, abstracted uh, to the system architectures. And uh, this is possible, and also we support that. Uh, we have many clients that do that, not just Continental, so that model clients in IBM. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, next question is, uh, when, when do we execute the logical model? Um, or, or is it, so the question is, I see functional model getting executed here, and do we also do execution of logical model? Um, yeah, short answer to this, don't start with the logical, because you can only do a logical verification, a logical model verification when you have your functions in. Start with the analysis, I, identify what you want to do. You can make even on the operational viewpoint a simplified model to not be ready for a complete functional design, but to show the major intended functionality. Do your design partly or completely in your functional viewpoint and embed the functions in the logical nodes. And then when you have everything done right, then you model the logical viewpoint, including a complete network including mm -hmm. communication models, whatever you want to include. But this gets then tough to achieve everything because you basically build the entire system executable. Enrico, since the, as Enrico said, it's really important this method because also at Airbus, for example, when I was working at Airbus, we were doing the same. We don't just allocate with a link the functional block to the logical node, the logical component, mm -hmm. but what we do, it's really, it's a part in SysML of the uh, block, okay? So it's a part, the function belongs a part, composition of the logical block. This means that also you can send data from the logical ports and this data can be read by the functions and then can be used in the execution. So you have synchronization between the logical node and the functional behavior. This is really important, okay? Because it's really how the system in reality is. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, thank you. Uh, next question is uh, around sharing of the recording. So yes, we will be sharing the recording via Incosa YouTube channel. So please uh, keep an eye on that. Um, and then the next question is from Prabhakaran. Uh, is this architecture also connected to requirements and doors? And if so, how is this connected? Um, there are several ways to connect. One simple way or the classic way to connect, for example, to a word or to an external uh, doors document is using the Rhapsody gateway, or you use the uh, lifecycle management, for example, doors next generation and the OSLC links directly to the model. But I think also Marco can explain you some, something more. Yeah, let's say that the most efficient way today, I will not recommend to have just uh, the requirement inside the models, because what will happen there that you will end up in a modeling silo. It means you will, you will try to overload the modeling tools and do everything the modeling tools. So I strongly recommend use, in our case, of course, uh, DOS next generation uh, and uh, to manage the requirements. Then you can have OSLC link between uh, the requirements and the model. You can visualize the requirements as a query in uh, uh, Rhapsody and you can see the preview of the models in rap from Rhapsody inside uh, DNG dot next generation. It's much more powerful, flexible, and scalable. Because in this way, not everybody needs to have access to the tool. They just need to access to the requirement environment. They can visualize the model from there, for example. Okay, so it's also scalable within organization. Yeah. You see, you can integrate those requirements here in Rhapsody. Uh, you can integrate features in Rhapsody. You can make also the attributization like you are familiar in indoors, for example. Uh, basically, if you want to make a full-blown MBSE, you can define all your requirements inside here as well. I hope maybe this is seen the screen. Maybe we can go quickly to the last two questions, uh, Mudit. So, yeah, sure. we can... yes. yeah. so the next question okay. is uh, from Samyak. Uh, please share or recommend any resources for reference. And uh, yeah, so if you have any resources you would like to share, maybe you can put up here in the chat. Or um, Samek, we also recommend you to, uh, you know, okay, maybe something to consider maybe on the LinkedIn uh, if you want to share. 
I, I just uh, recommend Ecosi System Engineering Handbook. Very good way to start on the process level. Yeah. Then, uh, if you want to learn about methods, I recommend uh, the book of a very big friend of mine, uh, one of the biggest experts of uh, uh, CSML, that's uh, Tim Bikins. And he will be also be part of the next uh, webinar, by the way, so mm -hmm. spoiling out something. And he wrote a book about architecture modeling. And uh, he developed some methodology called SysMod. Exactly. And this is like what I recommend uh, to uh, as for the method. For the tools, if you go on YouTube and Rhapsody Guru, Rhapsody Guru, there is a lot of very good resources for also my other, another friend, uh, Frank Brown, that uh, does a lot of fun uh, stuff and uh, interesting stuff with Rhapsody. Okay. Just three resources, process, method, and tools. Okay. If you're interested in this uh, viewpoints, more in detail, there's a so-called 4 plus 1 architecture view model, also used often in software. Here you can also find additional sources. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And then just quick, uh, I think last question. How long does it take to build a system model of such detail? Oh, uh, go, I forgot to show one slide. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. Um, yeah. Expect and five years plus um, approach. You cannot make, you cannot turn the switch. Today we make classic, tomorrow we make MBSE, will not work. You need to make it radially and think, dependent on the size of the organization, a five years plus path to go. So start small and grow gradually. Don't make the mistake to take the complexest system what you have and start to model with uneducated system engineers, you will fail. The resistance will be dramatically. People need to be educated, the otherwise there is no chance. The problem is not about modeling. This you can pick it up uh, if you are motivated yes. uh, quite yes. fast. The problem is about understanding uh, how to model a uh, system that are, for example, Correct. a media system no, that reflect the reality. So that's the most difficult part, not just, just yes. the modeling part, learning yes. how the, the tools. Yes. And uh, yeah, that's probably uh, the, the hardest part. Yes. Remember, 70% is thinking what you want to do, and 30% is the actual modeling, the drawing in the tool. But also yeah. recommendation, you can learn by yourself, but also there are many consulting companies that can help. No? And uh, so try to also to save time if you have the possibility to ask to the expert that do this every time and don't try to reinvent the wheel because this also will speed up your uh, your development huh? and learn. So okay. I see many other questions. Yeah, maybe yeah. I see one about the variability since a topic that I really like. Maybe mm -hmm. we can answer that. Uh, then maybe we need to stop to a certain point, but we can answer them online. So can we add variability into the model? So if you look for my name, I wrote uh, this year for Incosi a book about, uh, sorry, a book, an article about uh, two variant modeling methods at Airbus. And uh, you can see how variability can handle. Plus, uh, uh, Continenta has a viewpoint called uh, variability viewpoint. The Rico is just showing it now. So it's definitely possible. And maybe next year we are going to make something, we are going to talk about that probably in Rico. Huh? So we can organize something about specific for variability. Sure. And, and the next webinar will be about variability modeling uh, with the team Vikings in January. So exactly come uh, on purpose the question. So very good question. So you will learn more about how to model variability in reps. Okay, excellent. Okay, so I think with that, uh, we do come to the end of this webinar, and I would like to thank thank you uh, both very much. Thanks, Marco. Thanks, Enrico, for such an in insightful session. And we are looking forward for the next upcoming sessions as well. So thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining yeah. this. Please, thank you all uh, from my side. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Spending the time. Have a nice weekend. Bye-bye. Yeah.